baptized this morning. And what is even greater than her coming to be baptized, all that is pretty awesome. But today is Brinley's 10th birthday as well. So that, that's just cool, isn't it? To know that that's how she wants to celebrate her birthday. So a few weeks ago, she came to Brother Gary and was in his office, and there she accepted Christ as Savior there in his office. And she, uh, I got a text message about Gary was going to be out of town because Gary is in Taiwan, and she wanted to do this on her birthday. So it's incredible honor that, that I get to be a, a part of this. And so, Brindley, is it true that you accept Jesus as your Savior? Yes, sir. That is awesome. So it is on that profession, I'm going to let you grab here, that... I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Good morning, guys. Man, we're glad you're here this morning. Excited that you have come in here to worship this living king. Hope that's what you have come to do this morning is just lift high the name of Jesus. I want to tell you something that, that over the last couple of weeks that has been taking place of last Sunday, we took a group of about 50 people down to uh, Winter Jam down in Chattanooga, got back really, really late that night and got a little bit of sleep. Um, and then uh, we had a crazy week this week. And then this weekend, we also took a group of students to a thing called YEC, Youth Evangelism Conference in Nashville. Here's something that I've learned in the last week. I'm old. Um, I'm tired, and my body just don't recover like it used to. Um, but I do want to tell you something that, that kind of happened over the weekend. The weekend, there was about 6,500 teenagers that showed up in Nashville at the Municipal Auditorium. And out of those 6,500 students, 
780 students accepted Christ this weekend. And that's pretty awesome. But even on top of that, 61 people from the age of 12 to 61 surrendered to full-time ministry. 61-year-old lady walked an aisle and gave herself over to full-time ministry. If you're sitting here thinking, Matt, I'm 60 years old. I got nothing left to give. This lady just begs to differ, right? So you can still give. If you're here this morning and you're still breathing, God's not done with you. He's got a purpose and a plan. You're here for a reason. And so we just hope you catch on to whatever the plan is that God has for you. The guy who spoke yesterday, as we get ready to pray, the guy that spoke yesterday was a guy by the name of Jordan Easley. And he, he did something and as he began to pray that I fell in love with. And I told him after, the, after his message, I said, Jordan, I'm stealing that from you. And so here's what I want you to do. Everybody stand up with me. Baptist, I'm going to make you very uncomfortable for a moment, all right? Because I want you to raise both hands up in the air. I know this is totally anti-Baptist, right? Raise both hands up in the air. And here's how we're going to pray. You guys ready? Let's go. God, we, we, we are standing here with arms raised in surrender of saying, God, there is nothing in us that we have left. But God, we are totally surrendering everything that we have to you. God, we are in a posture of worship, of saying that you are worthy of every praise that comes from our mouth this morning. God, you are worthy. God, we worship you because you died for us. God, we worship you in your holiness. God, we worship you in all of your splendor and all of your awesomeness. God, we just simply worship you. Everybody look back up here at me, and I want you to change your posture, and I want you to hold your hands out like this in front of you. God, we are standing in a posture now of saying, God, we are giving you everything. There's nothing left in our hands. Everything is open to you. God, we also stand here with open hands, but open minds and open hearts, open souls ready to receive what you have for us here this morning. God, our hands are open and saying, God, give it to us. Speak to us through the worship, speak to us through the message, but God, we are here to receive from you this morning. One more posture. I want you, if you can, to get on a knee right where you are. If you can't, that's okay. You can sit back down. But if you can get on a knee right where you are, get on a knee where you are. God, we are now, have now placed ourselves in the most humble state we can. Of saying, God, when you step into a room, we can't even stand in your presence because you are holy. God, we are here on, bound, uh, on bending knees saying, God, there's nothing left. It is you and only you. But as God, as we begin to stand here in just a moment, God, as we stand back up, we are not standing in our own strength and our own power. We are standing in your might, in your strength, in your power. So God, as I pray, as we stand, that God, we are standing a new person because we are worshiping this awesome, awesome Jesus. So God, by your power, your strength, your might, your wisdom, you truly take over this time here this morning. Speak to us afresh and anew. Give us a new passion, a new desire, a new something to bubble up inside of us that we are just overflowing the goodness and the greatness of Jesus. And it's in that powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys. If you would, stick, shake a few hands those around you.
same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives within us, gives us the strength.
Spirit reign thou, reign thou, O Comforter and Friend, how we need to touch again, Holy Spirit.
That's our prayer. Holy Spirit, rain down on us, Lord, on every one of us, Lord, and fill us with your presence to, this, to the point that we are overflowing and this world cannot help but see that there's a difference in us, that there's a difference in the power of Christ living in us. And all God's people say it together. Amen. Amen. A police officer ran back to his car and telephoned his sergeant, and he frantically said, Sergeant, I have an interesting situation here. He said, I'm not sure how to handle this. A woman has shot her husband for walking on the freshly mopped floor that she just got through mopping. The sergeant said, well, arrest her. He said, I can't. He said, why not? He said, because the floor's still wet. Can anybody relate to that? <laughs> My wife would do the same to me and has threatened to when I've walked on her wet, clean floors. Please open your Bible to Acts chapter 19. You'll notice today I have a visual aid, a prop up here, and you'll notice this is a door, and it is an open door, because today I'm going to be preaching a message about open doors. We're going to use Acts chapter 19 as our text. The Apostle Paul stayed in Ephesus longer than any other place he stayed. Now, that wasn't normally the, the uh, pattern of, of the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul would usually go to a place. He would uh, kind of plant some seeds. They would have a, a revival, and uh, he would uh, kind of start a church, plant a church, and then he would move on. Whereas he was only in Thessalonica for three weeks, he stayed in Ephesus for three years. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, he tells us why he stayed so long in Ephesus. Listen to what he said. I am going to tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effectual door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. The reason that Paul stayed so long in Ephesus was because God had opened an incredible door for him. You've got to go where doors are open, right? And so God had opened this door for him. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus said to the church at Philadelphia, He said, I have set before you an open door. Let us all remember that it is God who opens doors. God who closes doors. God gives us these open doors, these opportunities. And then in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I heard about a new pastor who was out visiting one afternoon, and he was knocking on doors in a neighborhood and just going from house to house trying to invite people to the Lord. If the, if the opportunity was there, he would try to win them to the Lord. And he went to this one home, and it was obvious that somebody was there, but nobody was coming to the door. He knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked, but nobody would come to the door. He could hear the TV on. He could hear some, uh, some pitter-patter inside the, the house there. He knew that somebody was there, but they were just refusing to come to the door. So he took out one of his business cards, had his name and the church's name on it, and he wrote on the business card, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And he stuck it in the door. Well, the following Sunday when the offering was being processed, he found someone had returned his business card and added Genesis 3.10. I heard your voice, but I was naked and I hid myself. My friends, let us remember that it is God who opens the door and God who closes the doors. And so in Ephesus, God had opened this incredible door to the apostle Paul, and Paul was about to walk through this open door. Follow along as I begin reading Chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. And then Paul said, it John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. 
Now the men were about 12 in all. The first thing I want you to see this morning is Paul's opportunity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, in verses 8 and 9, Paul said that I am going to tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great and effectual door has been opened to me. Paul had been presented with an incredible opportunity. God had opened this wonderful door of opportunity for Paul there in Ephesus. You see, Ephesus was the hub of Asia Minor. It was a seacoast town, and because of that, ships came from all around the world. Ephesus was known as the Vanity Fair of Asia Minor. Ephesus was a great city, but it was filled with paganism. It was filled with sin. It was filled with debauchery. It was filled with criminals, and it was, it was a, a city that was oppressed by the occult. But in the midst of this dark place, God had placed Paul and given Paul the opportunity to bring the light of the gospel to these people. So God had opened this door for Paul. And when Paul said, I am going to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, of course he was referring to that Jewish celebration that they have every May that the Jews uh, still observe. Paul had decided to stay until Pentecost because he knew that every May in Ephesus, they had what you call the Pan-Ionian Games. Now, the Pan-Ionian Games were very similar to our Olympic Games, where athletes would come from all around the world to compete in all these various athletic competitions. And he, Paul knew that in Ephesus, they had a stadium the size of Thompson Bowling Arena that's, that would seat 25,000 people. And Paul knew that the city would be crammed full of people and he would have a great opportunity to share the gospel with thousands upon thousands of people. So he said, I'm going to tarry. I'm going to stay here until Pentecost, until the Pan-Ionian Games here. Now, when Paul gets to Ephesus, the Bible says he met about 12 men, a little group of disciples. But these men were deficient. What I mean by that is they had not received the full counsel of God. They didn't know about the Holy Spirit. They were Jewish proselytes, disciples of John the Baptist who were looking forward to a coming king, not Christians who were looking back to an accomplished uh, redemption. Their baptism was pre-Pentecostal baptism administered by John the Baptist, a baptism of expectation rather than a baptism of fulfillment. You see, these men knew about condemnation, they knew about repentance, they knew that they should live and do better morally, but they didn't know about the grace of Christ, they didn't know about salvation, and they did not know about the Holy Spirit. So Paul said, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and immediately they were baptized in Jesus' name. And Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit said that they spoke with tongues and prophesied. They were equipped for service. Now, let, let me just say something right here, okay? We have for too long isolated ourselves from this doctrine because somebody somewhere down the line abused the teaching. Now, what I'm saying is this. I want you to listen. We have shied away from this issue of tongues because we're afraid somebody's going to call us a holy roller or a Pentecostal or a pew jumper or a fundamentalist. We do not wish to be identified with tongue speaking, so we have shifted as far to the other side as we possibly can. But this is wrong because I believe in the gift of tongues. I believe that, the tongue, that tongues was a gift given for a particular season to authenticate the gospel. Now, the Bible says that when we're born again, the Holy Spirit immediately comes to live in our hearts. It's not like we get saved and then we have a second touch somewhere down the line where we get the Holy Spirit. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes into us and He stays there and there's nothing we can do to get rid of Him because uh, no one can pluck us out of the Father's hand. The Bible says that when we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes at that moment to live in our hearts. But tongues are not the evidence of being a born-again believer. Fruit is. You hear me good, folks. God is not looking for religious nuts. He's looking for spiritual food, fruit. And when we look at the lives of many people today, we do not see the spiritual fruit of the Holy Spirit. We do not see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, meekness, or self-control. 
And so that means one of two things. It means first either that these people have never been born again and they're just playing a game, that they're just kind of hiding behind a facade, they're just kind of playing the part, or two, they have been born again and they have allowed sin in the world to crowd out the Holy Spirit and quench the Holy Spirit in their lives. Now some denominations say if you don't have tongues, then you don't have the Spirit. But they neglect the fact that God gave these people on Pentecost soul-winning power and 3,000 people were saved. You see, the most important gifts are those where people get saved, not where you're calling attention to yourself. So when these people were baptized in the name of Jesus, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon them and they made a commitment to win others to Jesus Christ. God had opened an incredible door to the Apostle Paul in Ephesus. But let's not forget what else Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He said, God has opened a great and effectual door to me, but there are many adversaries. In other words, there are many obstacles. Let's look at Paul's obstacles. In Jerusalem, persecution came from organized religion. In Antioch, it stemmed from prejudice and envy. In Lystra, it was a result of paganism. In Thessalonica, it came from an unruly mob. In Athens, the gospel faced the opposition of worldly philosophy. In Corinth, it came from Judaism. And now in Ephesus, it's no different. Paul's facing obstacles. The obstacles that he's facing are several. One is hardened hearts. Notice verse 8. It says, when Paul arrived in Ephesus, he went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, Paul was a Jew, and the Bible says that uh, he, he was always taking the gospel first to his own people, to the Jews first, and then to the Gentiles, right? And so Paul did, just like he did in every other place he went to, the first thing he did when he arrived in a city is he would go to the, the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue, and he would take the gospel to his own people. And the Bible says that he did this in Ephesus. He went to his own people. He went to the synagogue. He started preaching the gospel there. And for three months, he tried to persuade his fellow Jews to be saved. Oh, how he yearned for his own people to know Christ. But verse six, 9 tells us that the Jewish people's hearts were hardened. And instead of listening to Paul, they rose up against Paul. They spoke evil of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. If you don't hear anything else I say this morning, preaching that makes no one angry and makes everybody happy is not gospel preaching. I, I think a few of you heard that, but I don't think all of you heard that. There's some of you and, and some of the people in this world that say, why can't we just make everybody happy? Why can't you just stay away from the controversial subject? Why can't you stay away from those subjects that might offend? Why can't we just sit around the campfire, hold hands, and sing kumbaya till Jesus comes? Because that's not the gospel. And I would not be true to what God has called me to preach. So when the Jews refused to listen to Paul, verse 9 says, he departed from them. In other words, if a preacher preaches the gospel and he's preaching the truth and people refuse to respond to it, he ought to go somewhere else. Amen? He's not going to sit there and pick apples out of a dead tree, is he? So he's facing hardened hearts, but he's also facing imitators. Look at verse 11. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. That word unusual there in the Greek means uh, unique. Out of the ordinary, not everyday run-of-the-mill miracles. Just as God saw fit to heal many by the shadow of Peter passing by people in Acts chapter 5, God saw fit to give the Apostle Paul the ability to perform unique miracles. And here's what it says there. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Paul had some incredible power didn't he it wasn't Paul's power it was the Holy Spirit's power it was the Lord using Paul Paul was just the conduit he was just the instrument that uh, that that God used to conduct those miracles right and so Paul you see was in a dark place and 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 God had to he was in a city that was under the influence of demonic power and so God gave Paul the ability to do these um, special unique out of the ordinary miracles to authenticate the the ministry and the gospel and to show the people the power and the truth of the gospel over in first corinthians chapter 12 it talks about the different gifts of the spirit 
talks about wisdom and discernment and prophecy and knowledge and uh, talks about uh, miracles and healing and uh, uh, tongues and the interpretation of tongues. But in that same chapter, it says, does everybody have the ability to work miracles? Does everybody have the gift of tongues? Does everybody have the gift of healing? In, Acts, in Mark chapter 16, it says, Certain signs and wonders will follow those that believe. And in my name they shall cast out demons, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Folks, that's what happened with the Apostle Paul. God gave him that ability to show the people, Hey, this is, this is my power. This is the power of the gospel. This is my servant. I'm working these miracles through him. But notice the obstacle Paul faced, verse 13. Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus over these evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. In other words, these exorcists decided, Hey, we've seen Paul do it. Why can't we do it? There's no reason that we can't go uh, imitate what Paul is doing. They wanted to be parrots of the Christian religion, right? And so verse 14 tells us about a Jewish priest named Siva and his seven sons who tried to practice this forgery. Folks, listen to me very carefully. Whenever God's people preach the truth, Satan will always send a counterfeit to oppose the preaching of the truth. Can I get a witness? Satan imitates whatever God's people are doing. So Siva and his sons were about to learn that in the name of Jesus... They could not perform this miracle. You know why? Because they didn't know the person they were calling on. Bottom line is, they, they were about to perform the ritual without having the relationship. You think we ever do that? We go through the ritual, but we, we don't have a relationship, do we? And so verses 15 and 16 says, The evil spirit answered him and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Now, I just find that hilarious because the Holy Spirit spoke to Siva. And he said, I know who Jesus is. I know who Paul is. But excuse me, who in the world are you? And it says there that the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, Siva and his seven sons over, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and Wounded. Folks, listen to me. You better not mess with demons if you don't have the authority of God to deal with them. I love this. Paul was doing such a good job for the Lord that, praise God, even the demons knew who he was. It says, I, I know who Jesus is, and I know who Paul is, but who are you? I wonder this morning, do the demons know who you are? Just, just kind of let that soak in for a minute. Are you so on fire for Jesus that they say, there goes that brother Tim again doing something special for Jesus. We better do something quick to stop him. Or do they not mess with you? It always bothers me when people say, the devil never messes with me. And that always bothers me. I don't, I don't say it to their face, but I'm thinking, you know, the devil doesn't mess with people he's already got. Hello? I think I stepped on some toes right there. Got awful quiet. Do the demons of hell know you? Let me show you another couple of obstacles Paul encountered in Ephesus. Idolatry and the occult. The city of Ephesus was the home of a magnificent temple. It was the home that was dedicated of a temple dedicated to Diana, the goddess of fertility. This, uh, w this temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was con uh, structed on a 130 pillars. It took 220 years to build this magnificent temple. This temple of Diana was the, the centerpiece of Ephesus. It was uh, several things to the people there. It was a banking institution. Kings and nations would come and store their treasures in that temple. It was a museum. Paintings and pictures and statues were displayed there. It was an asylum where criminals would come and hide out from the law. It was a religious uh, shrine where people would come and sacrifice and 
worship the goddess of fertility. The temple of Diana was a temple of hell that, that promoted idolatry and the occult. And it had its hold on the people of Ephesus. So we see that God had presented an incredible door of opportunity for Paul. And Paul is walking through that door. But Paul is facing all kinds of obstacles. Hardened hearts, imitators, idolatry, and the occult. But praise God, let me show you something else. Let me show you Paul's overcoming. Notice after the demon whooped up on Siva and his seven sons, the Bible says in verse 17, this became known to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the, Lord, the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Hallelujah, God got the glory. Amen. Whenever Jesus is exalted, sin is exposed. Now notice what it says in verses 18 and following. And many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds. That means simply that many people got saved. And then many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them. And it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. In other words, they were being convicted by the Holy Spirit. Once they got saved, they knew they had to break pa uh, the, the ties with their past. They realized the evil of magic and witchcraft. So they had a big bonfire and they burned all of the devil's literature. Today it is estimated... That over 50 million Americans, I don't know if you heard me, 50 million Americans are involved in some form of the occult. Bookstores have a hard time keeping books about witchcraft and magic and the occult in stock. As Christians, we need to be aware that you don't mess with demons. The demons that were present in, in, in Paul's day are still present in the world today. You can't say, but preacher, I don't believe in demons. If you say over here that you believe in angels, because you can't deny one, uh, believe in one and deny the other. Angels are real and so are demons. And so people in the world today that think Ouija boards and tarot cards and seances are silly games, they are fooling themselves because, friends, they are not toys. They are dangerous tools of the enemy. Be careful. Satan just wants to get his claws in you. Some of you say, well, what's wrong with a horoscope? What's wrong with calling a psychic? Line, tools of the devil. They're not. They're not toys. By the way, <clears throat> by the way, I heard about a lonely frog. And this frog called the psychic hotline one day. He was pretty lonely. He said, "What? What do you see for my future?" And the psychic on the other end of the phone line said, uh, "You're going to meet a beautiful blonde-headed girl, and she wants to know everything about you." Frog got excited. He said, is that going to be at a party? And the psychic said, no, you're going to meet her in biology class. Okay, so <laughs> don't mess with Ouija boards, tarot cards, seances, horoscopes, psychic hotlines. Praise the Lord, these Ephesians had come to Christ and they were burning their bridges to the past, weren't they? Nothing shows the reality of their transformation more than the experience that they showed by being willing to burn their books and their charms, which were so profitable to them. On October the 3rd, 1998, while on a mission trip in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, we were doing some street witnessing. And we had the opportunity. We, 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 you see, here I am on the right here. And... Um, we, we had this opportunity to talk to this man, and we did not discover and realize at first that this was the grand wizard of black Macumba magic. The missionary is on, on the uh, left there, and I'm on the right. We started sharing the gospel with him. And when we got to the point where it says that you must confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that the Lord Jesus Christ is saved, this man's eyes rolled back in his head. He jumped up. He started roar, and, 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 and it scared me, literally. And he just started running around like a crazed maniac. He ran back in the house, the door right behind him there. He ran back in the house, ran up the stairs, and he was about to jump out the window 
window. I mean, he was possessed. We, I've never seen anything like this. I tell you, I was shaking in my boots. I was scared to death. I don't know if I wet my pants, but I think I dribbled a little bit, okay? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to tell you, I've never seen anything like it. And we grabbed him. These people... They're standing around us. We're going. When you go out witnessing in, in Brazil, people from the church, they show up and they go with you. And they stand over there and pray for you while you're witnessing. Isn't that awesome? And so we, 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 we pull the guy back in the window there. And, and we just, uh, a couple of them laid across him there. And, and we put our hands on him. And, and I, we just started praying. And an hour and a half later, that demon left that guy, and hallelujah, he got saved. Now, when we went back the next day, here's the neat thing. We went back the next day just to check on him, and we went back to see what he was doing, just to follow up, and I kid you not, as God is my witness, right there, the same place we witnessed to him, he had a little bonfire in the street, and he was burning every bit of his witchcraft paraphernalia. My friend, when a person comes to Christ, there is no lingering or looking back. They have to make a clean break with the past. And I'm telling you, it's time for us to make a clean break with the past. It's time for us to get rid of those things in our life that shouldn't be there. It's time for us to get rid of those things in our homes that would be dishonoring to the Lord and displeasing to the Lord. Now, when visitors came to Ephesus, they always took home a little souvenir and the, the most popular souvenir of Ephesus was a little silver statue of Diana now because so many people were getting saved the craftsmen who were making these little statues felt threatened so it says in verse 24 look at it a man named Demetrius a silversmith who made little idols of Diana called all the craftsmen together and he said guys we're losing business now folks if you want to get somebody mad at you just Touch their pocketbook. Hello? Preach about sinful things like drugs and alcohol and gambling and extortion and dishonesty and cheating. People will get upset in, in a drop of a hat, won't they? These craftsmen got upset and they started shouting, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they got the crowd riled up. And the crowd started yelling that same thing. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they shouted this for two hours. Fearing a riot was going to break out, the town clerk came out. He appeased the crowd. He dismissed them, and they went about their business. Praise God. Even God can use an enemy. To advance his purposes. Amen? So what have we learned today? What do we need to do when God opens a door for us? What do we need to do when Satan throws all these obstacles in our way? We need to keep on preaching the gospel and we need to keep on being faithful. Were these craftsmen justified in their fears? They, I believe they were. Because scholars tell us that shortly after the Apostle Paul left the city of Ephesus, that there was a fire. And the temple of Diana burned to the ground. And because of the revival, because of the spiritual awakening, there was so little interest on the people, the part of the people, that they never bothered to rebuild that temple. Today, a rusty sign and a few broken column fragments stacked on a crude cement base are the only remains of this ancient temple beloved listen to me if those of us who claim to be Christians would make Jesus the Lord of our lives and refrain from sinful things and take a staunch stand for what is right the liquor stores the adult bookstores the abortion clinics the drug houses the whore houses and the casinos would go out of business tomorrow let me ask you a question this morning. Are you troubling the demons by your faithfulness to the Lord? Are you doing so much for Jesus that even the demons know your name? What door is God opening to you today? Is God opening the door of salvation to you today? 
It's either the world and its pleasures and its God's little G or it's Christ. The choice is yours. Maybe the Lord's opened the door of baptism to you today like little Brindley. Maybe the Lord's opened the door of church membership to you today. Maybe the Lord's opening the door for you to rededicate your life. Maybe the Lord's opening the door for you to share the gospel with a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker. I would close this morning by asking you, what door is being opened to you today? Would you bow with me? Father, we come now to this time where we Because of your patience, your kindness, your mercy, you're giving us a chance to respond. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the preaching of the gospel. But we know too that you give us an opportunity, a chance to respond to that. You do not force yourself on us. You do not come beating the door down. You give us the opportunity to open our hearts and our life to you. That's why the doorknob is figuratively on the inside we have that sole responsibility so right now every one of us are either going to open that door to you we're going to walk through that open door for you or we're going to slam that door on you have your way with us Lord I hope it will either be the first or second choice. And God forbid that it would be the third choice that we would slam the door on you. Thank you that we can come just as we are. But we don't have to leave just as we came. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet and come as we sing? Just as I
Y'all please join me in prayer. And Father God, we thank you so much for a beautiful day, Lord. Thank you so much for the message we heard. Father, I pray and ask that you'll uh, help apply it to our lives, Lord. Father, it's my prayer, Lord, that you'll help us look at our lives, Lord. Any hindrance, Lord, that there is in a relationship with you, Lord, I pray you'll bring it to the surface and let us repent of it, Father, and confess it and uh, rejoin the relationship you asked us to have. Now, Father, I pray over this offering, Lord. Father, I pray that you will use it to your glory and for your further your kingdom. And Father, we